Welcome to Body Signals, a Cygnos podcast. I'm your host, Bill Tanser, Chief Data Scientist at Cygnos. This is Season 2, Episode 6, a conversation with best-selling author, nutrition and fitness expert, Rob Wolf. On today's episode, we're thrilled to sit down and talk with Rob about his book, Wired to Eat. For those of you who don't know Rob, he's a New York Times best-selling author. He hosts one of the top-ranked podcasts on iTunes Podcast. Along with being an accomplished author, he also founded the first affiliate CrossFit gym in the world. Rob has served as a review editor for the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism. He also served as a consultant for the Naval Special Warfare Resiliency Program and has provided nutrition, strength, and conditioning training to a number of entities, including NASA and the U.S. Marine Corps. Today, we'll be discussing Rob's background and what led him to write his best-selling books, The Paleo Solution and Wired to Eat. He'll give us a primer on how digestion and metabolism work. We'll discuss personalized nutrition and the power of understanding how your body processes foods. And we'll talk about the seven-day carb fast, a methodology he presented in Wired to Eat that can help you discover what carbs work best for you. This episode is jam-packed with great information. It's one you don't want to miss. Trust me. Now on to today's show. Welcome back, everybody, to Body Signals. We are so thrilled and honored to have Rob Wolf here. Rob is a former research biochemist. He's a two times New York Times Wall Street Journal bestselling author of The Paleo Solution and Wired to Eat. We're going to spend the majority of the podcast today talking about Wired to Eat. He also just came out with another book he co authored with Diana Rogers, uh, recently re- released The Sacred Cow. Uh, which is a book that explains why well-raised meat is good for us and good for the planet. And Rob, welcome to Body Signals. Huge honor to be here. Thank you. So just finished reading uh, Wired to Eat. Absolutely loved the book. It was such an enjoyable read. And one of the things I love about the book is that you started with your own personal story. And I wonder if you just wouldn't mind giving our listeners some insight as to your own uh, health journey that uh, that you kind of wrote about in the beginning of of Wired to Eat. Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. It, it uh, I'll, I'll turn fifty later this month, so uh, the, the journey uh, continues and the story gets longer and longer. So I'll try to well, try to keep. Well, it, happy uh, early concise. birthday then. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, so it was raised in a a family that was not particularly healthy. Both my folks uh, smoked. My dad drank a lot. Uh, both parents developed type two diabetes. Probably late thirties, early forties. Um, you know, it, as far back as I could remember, there was just this kind of never ending list of health issues that both of them had. And I had a sneaky suspicion that if I ate in a different way and lived in a different way, that I might be able to avoid the bulk, bulk of those problems. And, uh, you know, in, in tinkering with, uh, the way that I ate, I eventually adopted a, uh, high carb, low fat vegan diet, And I think for some people that probably works wonderfully. For me, it was a horrible disaster. Uh, I ended up with ulcerative colitis uh, so bad that I was facing a bowel resection, immunosuppressant drugs. And this was when I was about 26, 27 and um, I was a research biochemist was doing cancer and autoimmunity research and was kind of trying to figure out if I wanted to go to medical school, a PhD track, an MD PhD track, but I got really sick and I had to figure out what I was going to do with that. And this idea of an ancestral health or paleo type diet got on my radar and I started tinkering with that. And for me, that was, you know, a life-saving event. And not long after that, maybe a year, year and a half later, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. The idea of medical school wasn't nearly as appealing to me once I I, I saw how powerful basic dietary intervention was for me and and it kind of jibed with the the type of, you know, quote, medicine that I would want to do and how far afield that that was from what most doctors did. Like even at that time, this was, you know, 98 through maybe 2001, 2002, um, it, more and more what doctors do is just shuffle notes and write notes and document what they've been doing and and spend less and less and less time actually working with people, you know, because of the the nature of like uh, the the 
insurance, you know, process and all that type of stuff. So being a doctor just looked less and less interesting, less fun. It looked more and more like a highly trained technician than somebody that that was really doing interesting, creative stuff. And so right around this time, I found a kind of a weird workout online called CrossFit. And I started doing some of the workouts with a good friend of mine, Dave Werner, who's a retired Navy SEAL. And we converted his garage into a, a, you know, a gym. And about three, four months down the road, we had 12, 15 people that were training with us. And we reached out to Greg and Lauren Glassman, the founders of CrossFit. And we basically said, hey, we love what you're doing. And we'd like to open a gym and would like to call it CrossFit. Can we do that? And they said, yes, go do it. And I think the first five years, at the, that was the first CrossFit affiliate gym right. in the world. And then I went on to open the fourth CrossFit affiliate gym, CrossFit NorCal down in Chico, California. But I think we were both open three years, maybe four years before we ever got a contract from from Greg and Lauren. Like it, it was incredibly wild west there at the the very beginning of all that. But that was really where I I got to start with what, all this, you know. What what year was that that uh, you opened that first? The first uh, one was in two thousand two. And then it was 2002, 2003, and then it was uh, to January 24th, 2004. That was my 35th birthday, I, I, I think, um, when – or not 35th, uh, uh, but the, it was my, my birthday um, when we opened the gym in Chico. And, wow. And yeah, yeah. That that's amazing. I mean, you, in LA, I, I'm in LA. You can't drive, uh, you know, a couple of blocks without running into a CrossFit box. These right. days, I mean, they're they're right. everywhere. To know that you're the 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 founder of the first affiliate gym is is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool, but and yeah. it uh, it provided a huge opportunity. I I worked for CrossFit and so did a lot of traveling, and then we had our own brick and mortar facility for the better part of ten years, and it just allowed me to work with tens of thousands of people, and and I got to work with elite level athletes and and. Uh, you know, police, military, and fire. I was on the Naval Special Warfare Resiliency Program for for a number of years where I would go speak to the SEAL teams, the special boat teams, and their families about sleep, food, nutrition, you know, different resiliency topics. And so I really had this cool opportunity to work with a lot of people. But the the um, I guess center of the bullseye for me has always been folks with complex gut, autoimmune and metabolic issues, which is very much the the problems that I've faced over over time. So um, some people, when they head into like health and fitness, um, they really aspire to work with like professional athletes. And, and I did some of that, but I never found it that interesting because it, it didn't. The main thing that I needed to do with a professional athlete was just not screw up. Like I just needed to not make a major mistake that was going to like cost this person a championship or, you know, give them an injury or really retrograde performance, but I, it felt more like being a, a speed bump or a babysitter than really, you know, like helping someone. Whereas if somebody had run the gauntlet of standard medical care and they still had complex gut issues and autoimmune issues and their doctors had no way of figuring this stuff out, like I could really help that person if they gave me 30 days. And, and, and the cool thing about what I was putting forward, maybe it's nuts, maybe I'm an idiot, maybe it's all wrong, but I couched it in try this for 30 days. And if you don't look, feel and perform better, if your lab markers don't improve, then we're doing something wrong and we can, and you can change what you're doing. And so it's a, it's a very easy, transparent process. And with that transparency, I started getting these really amazing results. Like our gym was picked as uh, one of men's health top 30 gyms in America within two years of being open because we had people from all over the world coming to our gym to, to work with us because we really help people. And, it, you know, losing weight was clearly one of the, the big factors, but it was dealing with these complex gut autoimmune issues that, that, um, you know, really drew a lot of people in. And when you add results with folks that had had a condition for 20, 30 years, and within a month you, you had these people like, rocking, you know, doing better than they had done in 20 or 30 years. You, you had a walking, talking, advocating billboard that you, no amount of money could pay for, you know, because it was a legit story and sincere emotion. And so then those people went out and began advocating for us. And that, that's kind of been the the story of our career thus far. 
Yeah, you know what I I, um, I really enjoyed, other than that that background, which was in the book, and, and everyone should go out and get a copy of Wired to Eat. There are some just amazing um, nuggets of information and knowledge in that book that uh, I haven't found anywhere else. But one of the things I really loved about the book is that it's not a uh, a bunch of uh, almost like religious dogma about a specific diet. You really do take the approach of let's test this out, which is the same philosophy that we have at Cygnos is we're not going to tell you eat this, don't eat that. I mean, yes, you do have some some background in paleo, but as you point out in your book, you're not religious about it. It's more about finding what works for you. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about personalized nutrition because I think that is a fascinating topic in of, a, of itself. What I'd like to start with, what I appreciated in your book is that you you also did what I find in few books about uh, health and weight loss and 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 diet, not being on a diet, but just you know the topic of your diet. You walked through just the basics of digestion. I know it's been decades since I took a human anatomy course, and so uh, I actually appreciated it and and you had me right away. At something that I, I believe is cephalic insulin response, talking about what happens before you actually eat. Right. Uh, and there is something happening there. So maybe you could just give us, if, I, if you don't mind, if I um, have you just run through the basics of digestion, because we haven't really covered that on the, the podcast yet. And I think... Uh, it would really help people understand some of the things that we're going to talk about next. Sure. It's, uh, it, it's funny because it's something that we, we do our whole life, you know, and le- even if people end up with uh, severe GI damage, like they have a colostomy bag or something like that, they still have to absorb nutrients from outside the world into their body. And, you know, how do you take a chicken or broccoli or apple and bring it into your mouth, and then somehow that ends up in your body in the form of energy and vitamins and minerals and nutrients, and some part of it ends up getting excreted in the the southbound you know part of that and it, it is actually kind of a a fascinating and very elegant system and the the uh, the whole process you could argue starts in the mouth, but i would I would make the case that it starts even prior to that because we are technologically versed organisms. And and so sometimes within vegan land, people will say, well, we're not meant to eat meat because we don't have canines and these, you know, these types of incisors and everything. But if we use that argument, um, we're really not meant to eat corn or rice or any of these other things that require threshing and milling and cooking. You can't eat grains unless they're cooked. They're toxic and, and not just toxic, but the the starch granules in grains are indigestible to us unless they're cooked. So, um, you, you know, the, the, the technology piece is huge. So you can maybe make the argument that the digestion starts before we even put it in our mouth, depending on what type of, uh, uh, technology we use to process something like, uh, an, a common, recommendation to get kids to eat more fruits and vegetables is to cut them up small because it makes it easier for them to chew. And so the kids are more likely to, to do that. And this is facilitating digestion. If it goes in your mouth smaller, then you have less work to do with chewing. But the, you know, we have, uh, the, the chewing process, which is the initial mainly physical breakdown of food. We get a little bit of salivary amylase that starts breaking down some some starch, uh, the better we chew our food, typically the, the better the digestion is in virtually every like religious practice, spiritual practice has some recommendation about mindfulness while eating and, you know, chewing our food thoroughly and that, that, you know, uh, uh, it seems to correlate well with, with better digestion. Um, I always forget if it, it was Hippocrates, I think that was, uh, quoted as, as uh, all disease begins in the gut, you know, and so there's been a long standing, you know, recognition that the gut is pretty important for, for overall health. But from, from, you know, chewing and, and getting some saliva that, that may be, do the initial stages of a carbohydrate digestion, we end up in the stomach. And interestingly, the human gut is remarkably acidic. It, it's, uh, it has a pH of around two which is more acidic than most carnivores and nearly as acidic as uh, most scavenger animals. You know, things like like vultures and, and hyenas that routinely eat carrion that is 
rotten, you know, or heading towards rotten. And they, they have these uh, digestive tracts that are so acidic that it just kind of nukes everything that, that is in there near everything. And it, it helps protect them from bacteria and viruses and, and uh, uh, parasites and whatnot, at least to some degree. So the human digestive tract is, is uh, highly acidic, uh, again, much more akin to a scavenger slash uh, predator than it is to the the alkaline uh, GI tract or largely alkaline GI tract of like a, a gorilla or something. So um, in the stomach, we release uh, some uh, pepsin, pepsinogen, uh, basically a little bit of protein digestion occurs, and that's all facilitated with the, the acid in the stomach. And then that is squirted into the small intestine. And this is where some really big lifting occurs on digestion we we get some bile salts from the the liver uh produces bile and then it's stored in the gallbladder that's injected into our food and mixed they call it a, a chyme and then the pancreas uh, releases all kinds of different digestive enzymes and those enzymes are only active in an alkaline ph so we go from an acidic environment in the stomach where certain enzymes and activities occur and then we totally flip the switch. We go to an alkaline environment in the uh, the small intestine. And this is where proteins, carbohydrates, and fats are largely broken down and, and begin the, the uh, absorption process. And proteins start off in, in these uh, complex structures, like 3D structures built out of, out of uh, amino acids. And we have to take these sometimes thousands of pro, uh, amino acid long structures and break them down into single or double uh, peptide, uh, single amino acids or dipeptides to, to amino acids. And that's the way that ideally proteins are absorbed. So they get uh, moved through the intestinal lumen. And that's a whole fascinating story where we go through a mucosal layer into the cells and those cells then move it. Uh, uh, the material into the hepatic uh, uh, circulation, the uh, carbohydrates do largely the same. And then the fats, interestingly, end up in a, a separate kind of transit where they, they get wrapped. It, because fat does not, it, fats and lipids don't easily dissolve in water, they get wrapped in these things called micelles. And it's, uh, it's kind of like soap, like, like the chemical structure is, is very similar to soap. It's, it's made out of, uh, uh, cholesterol and lipoproteins, but it, it puts the, the, the non-polar portions of the fats inside these little micellular structures. And then there are these parts that face out into the aqueous or the water portion. And that goes through the, uh, uh, lymphatic circulation up to our neck actually and then it dumps into our circulation and then it makes its way to the liver and gets it you know re-stitched back together but all of these proteins carbohydrates and fats from our foods get broken down into these very basic building blocks as they go through digestion and then they get re-stitched back together into eyes and ears and hair and enzymes and get stored as glycogen and get stored as fat. And that, uh, that may have been more or less than what you wanted with a, a survey of digestion. But um, it, it's important. It, it's something to keep in mind is that from our mouth to our hoo-ha is outside the body. It's a tube. It's basically a straw that, that goes all the way through. And people have done some crazy crazy things where they'll swallow cameras and it goes all the way through or some of these kind of kind of interesting yogic figures have swallowed like a, uh, a bit of yarn and they they allow it to go all the way through so the yarn is it both inside and outside them but it's basically outside the body and where yeah you know I, yeah. I love that you got kind of philosophical and wired to eat where you pose the question is is food inside or outside of us and I think that's what you're referring to now yeah. is just this tube that goes through us, right? Yeah. And, and you can make the argument either way, but it's a fascinating argument. To, yeah, to it, it's much more akin to if you held a hot dog in your hands, is that inside your body or outside your body? And it's like, well, that's outside your body. Okay. The, it, and if we could di digest in, uh, food in our hands, it would end up breaking it down and then moving it through the cells of our hands into our body. And that's really what digestion is if we wanted to, to really simplify things down to a, a very base level. But 
There's a, a shocking amount of stuff that goes on there. The largest repository of our immune system is in the gut. It's in the, uh, the gut, the gut associated lymphoid tissue. And, uh, it, it, it oftentimes the gut is called the second brain because there's so much neurological innervation and also so much information processing that occurs in the immune system because this is a lot of where we determine self from non self. If, um, uh, the role and you know, we're in this pandemic where we're, we're dealing with this, uh, you know, virus and our bodies need to determine if something is us or not us. And, a super hot immune system can inaccurately label something that is part of us as foreign and it will attack it. And this is autoimmune disease. And so type one diabetes, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, all these things are situations where for whatever reason, the body has been tricked into believing that parts of us are foreign and, and need to be attacked. And one of the ways that this appears to occur is leaky gut, a, a movement of whole intact food particles through the gut because the gut is damaged in a variety of ways. And so these uh, different food particles, like parts of agalbumin, have parts of that protein look like proteins in our body. So if, the, if our immune system creates antibodies to agalbumin, it's possible that we can end up having those same antibodies attack us. And there's a host of, of situations like this. This can also happen sometimes in the response to viral infections. But the linkage to intestinal permeability, also called leaky gut, and, um, and autoimmune disease is just staggering. Like, it, it, it's clear cut now. And it's worth mentioning. So we're in this period of time right now where people are saying, follow the science, follow the science. The science is settled. The science is never settled. Like, in the... Early 2000s, when one went on PubMed and searched for intestinal permeability, um, this was the stuff of quacks. Like uh, the idea of leaky gut was considered to be 100% quackery. There was not good science to support it. It was totally anecdotal. And now it's crystal clear that intestinal permeability is a thing. If you If one searches intestinal permeability on PubMed now, it's either the number one or the number two search term that is prompted as a response. And it's the, the intestinal, uh, you know, gut microbiome, intestinal permeability is the hottest area of immunology at this point, arguably. So 15 years ago, 20 years ago, this was a, a topic that was considered quackery and heresy. And now it is the hottest area of immunological research. So I just throw that out there to remind people the science is never settled. There's always nuance to be found. And it, it doesn't mean that we believe every idea that is cast our way. But it's also um, it's worth just just maintaining a little bit of circumspection around these topics. So again, I, I because I've been in this thing this whole life cycle, like I was in this space when suggesting that autoimmune disease could be caused by intestinal permeability and more controversially might be treated by addressing intestinal permeability like that was absolute quackery people lost their medical licenses and were ridiculed and now this is maybe not standard practice to understand this but it is very mainstream to understand that there is a linkage between uh intestinal permeability autoimmune disease and uh we now have 20 30 randomized control trials where different types of of uh dietary interventions have been used successfully to treat and mitigate uh, autoimmune disease, and the main mechanism that it's addressing is intestinal permeability. It's yeah, I'm so glad you said that. And, and I actually would would like to link what you're saying with what you brought up earlier, which is mindfulness. You know, especially right now, beginning of the year, a lot of people thinking about New Year's resolutions, losing weight. You've got all these diets out there, uh, religious dogma, uh, essentially about eat this, not that. I believe. What you just walked us through, just how the uh, digestive tract works and understanding these things and being curious about them is a form of mindfulness. And the more you engage in researching these things, having an open mind, going and doing the actual research, read some of these trials uh, versus uh, what someone's take on these trials are, 
is a great place to start to start thinking differently about what you're eating. And I think also realize that the human body is amazingly complex. If someone just tells you this is the way it is, the debate is over. Probably not the place to end your research. You probably want to right. go a little bit further and read as much as you can. But yes, that, thank you so much for taking us through that. I, I'd love to to um, to focus in on one of the parts of the digestion that I think uh, you um, you devote a whole chapter to, which is the personalized nature of nutrition. Um, I think I've mentioned the study on every single episode of Body Signals, but there's this this landmark study came out of the Weizmann Institute, was published in Cell Magazine in 2015, and it's all about um, the personalized prediction of glycemic responses to foods. Wonder if you could just give us a little bit of background. You, since you devoted a whole chapter to this, I think you've got some deeper insight than than what we've dis- discussed before. So I'd love to just kind of talk about this study a little bit and why you decided to devote a chapter to it. Yeah, I mean it 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 it, it got a chapter, but it was really the reason why I wrote the book because the the, the front end of that was that I had. Uh, encountered some evolutionary biology work, and I'll, I'll ping you the, the link to this paper. The rough title of the paper is uh, Determinants of Brain Evolution, the Omnivore's Real Dilemma. And it basically talks about the neuroregulation of appetite, uh, optimum foraging strategy, protein leverage hypothesis, that basically organisms try to get as much nutrition as possible, doing as little as possible. This is completely counter to everything that we are told from an implementation standpoint. We are told just eat more and move less. And this, again, I can't emphasize this enough, and maybe it's because I'm a geek and I don't have a great social life and don't get out a lot, but this this thing like really gut punches me. But the mainstream media, the, the American Medical Association, the American Dietetics Association, it's all about portion control and moderation. And This is antithetical to the reason why we are here as a species. We are here because we are gluttonous. We ate everything we could possibly eat that was available within reason, and then we rested. And then we were forced to get out and do work to to do that whole process again. So our basic evolutionary wiring is 100% counter to the the dominant narrative. And when I encountered this paper, it was just holy smokes. And it it really, um, it it was the crux of the book around the whole concept that it's not your fault. Like if you are overweight and sick and struggling in this modern world, it's not your fault. Now I'm not in the camp that I'm just like, oh, well, it's okay. And there are no consequences to this. I think that's lying to people. I think that it's incredibly injurious. It is crystal clear that people with overweight and metabolic disease are going to live shorter lives are going to have greater medical complications. Like we're not doing people favors, either ridiculing them because of their state or lying to them that it's okay that you're five foot four and 380 pounds. Like it, 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 neither of those two things are true, but there's this middle ground there, this, this third option, which is, Hey, we understand why you are the way you are. You live in a world of hyper palatable foods and it, 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 and we're genetically wired to want to eat more and move less. That's the way the situation is, but now we need to figure out a strategy for how to deal with that. So that was the front part of the book. But I didn't feel like I had a whole book out of that. Like I knew it was really important, but it, it was uh, the what do you do part wasn't really going to be qualitatively different at that point. Than, and this was around 2016 that um, that uh, I guess it's around 2014 that I found that that first paper. And then it was 2015, 2016 that the Weitzman paper came out. And that is what made me realize, okay, I've got a legit book here it, because what the Weitzman paper material suggested, it, what they did initially is they did very complete assessment of folks, uh, gut microbiome sequencing, genetic uh, tests of the individuals, uh, uh, really extensive lipidology and, you know, basic metabolic, in, uh, you know, analysis of these folks. And then they started feeding them different meals while these folks were wearing a continuous blood glucose monitor. And what they found was 
both fascinating and pretty counterintuitive where it's been long assumed that there's uh, this thing called the glycemic index. And it was assumed that the glycemic index was pretty uniform from person to person. Like, you know, white rice would, would it cause most likely a higher blood glucose response than brown rice based off of the, the fiber content and whatnot. And there, there is some truth to that, but what they found that was really interesting is one person would eat say a banana and have a completely normal blood glucose response, like like as if uh, they had barely eaten any carbohydrate. Another person would eat a banana, and their blood glucose would be nearly diabetic in in magnitude. And another person would eat a cookie, and you know they would uh, have a very nice blood glucose response. Another person would eat a cookie, and they'd have a terrible blood glucose response. So what they found is that there was this huge variability in blood glucose responses from person to person. Uh, and also from an individual based off of the foods that they ate. So they might do great with white rice and terribly with quinoa or something like that. And there's this great example you pointed out. You had a chart from the study of someone who had just pure glucose that yep. spiked less on the glucose than on uh, bread. They they spiked a lot more on the bread, which didn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, and it, it really doesn't make sense until we think about some of the immunogenic properties of foods where they are pro-inflammatory. And this is where I think kind of the paleo diet stuff is germane and is, is important because it it talks about the immunogenic properties of foods. And if they cause a, a an inflammatory response, that is a stress. So some of that increased blood glucose response is actually coming out of the liver from a uh, cortisol and stress in response to, to, uh, you know, a, a problematic food. But what the Weitzman paper also suggested, so, so macro level, it just, it said, holy smokes, like there's way more variation here than what we thought. You, it's not standard person to person, food to food. You can't just make these broad sweeping generalizations and if people really want to be healthy and kind of successful long term with their their you know having a healthy body weight and you know uh, all the stuff that's associated with that what they need to do is eat in a way either the amounts or types of foods that keep their blood glucose within pretty tight you know boundaries if the blood glucose goes too high that's pro-inflammatory and it damages the gut, it damages the vascular system, it damages the hormonal system, and we tend to then overeat and it's just, you know, all of these problems ensue from there. And then the flip side is if we figure out a way of eating that is, is uh, you know, maintains good blood glucose levels, then all kinds of good things happen. And another thing insight came to me out of this and it, it kind of split the Gordian knot of the whole high carb versus low carb thing, because we all know somebody who eats tons of carbs and they're lean and they're metabolically healthy. And, and maybe they even feel like garbage on a low carb diet. Um, I am not that person. I, I am the person who does pretty darn well on a low carb diet and I'm metabolically healthy and have good performance. But you know, what is it that that's different about these people is kind of hard to figure out, but what is the thing that is similar about these people? The thing that is similar is that when I eat a low carb diet, I have a very modest blood glucose response to it. When somebody who is metabolically flexible and does well with carbohydrates, when they eat a lot of carbs, they don't get a really profound blood glucose response to it. Otherwise, it would be making them sick and causing them problems. And so the the big takeaway was that the for the metabolically healthy person, their blood glucose response to carbs looks like my blood glucose response to protein and fat. And that was like the, you know, pretty big takeaway. And the interesting thing, the book sold uh, quite well, but it, it did better among um, practitioners and coaches than it did among the like lay populace, like people who work with other people really found a huge amount of benefit with, with wired to eat because I think it provided a lot of these like aha moments around, well, why is, why does this person do well with carbs and this person doesn't, and what do I need to do with their diets to be able to, to get some synergy out of them? Well, you make sure that their blood glucose response looks like this after a meal and they're going to be pretty good to go. Let me ask you a controversial question based on all that then. Does this, what we found in the Weitzman Institute study, does that put a nail in the coffin of the debate over whether it's a carb insulin 
uh, model or just a thermogenic calorie in calorie out model or are we still unsettled on the issue as to which camp is right? I, I'm definitely not in the Gary Tobbs camp that that it's uh, carbohydrates and insulin. And so long as you keep uh, uh, insulin low, that that we can't gain fat. I think that's patently false. Like we we have uh, low carb athletes that gain weight on a ketogenic diet all the time. We have people who begin eating ketogenic diets and then eat uh, you know consume three buttered coffees a day and they end up gaining weight on it, you know? So <laughs> yeah, that is clearly not true. Um, thermodynamics do rear their head at some point, but the flip side of this from the, the kind of smug evidence-based nutrition crowd is that protein is not the same as carbs and fat with, with, and most, most people are sophisticated enough to acknowledge that now almost grudgingly. Or they'll be grudging on the one hand, but then like, well, you're an idiot if you don't eat more protein because it's satiating and high thermic effect. So protein is not, uh, uh, you know, the same as as carbs and, and fat. When we're talking about carbs and fat specifically, there is a reality that if we talk about oxidative priority, um, fat stores easier than carbs do. Like it only needs to get broken up and then... It can get stored and carbs can be stored as glycogen. But if you want to store them as fat, it has to go through the liver and de novo lipogenesis. And then they've got to, you know, get get packaged into, uh, you know, the uh, VLDLs to be to be launched out of the, the liver. And so it's a much more energetic and time consuming process. So the the thing that wins in making people fat is a meal that is hyper palatable and loaded with fat and carbs. And you do several of those meals a day, every day. So we overeat. We overeat in a way that spikes insulin. And while insulin is elevated, that makes it easy to store everything. We also have a bunch of circulating fat, which is just insanely easy to store. And and that's kind of where I am on this. And I I, uh, I, I think here's even a, a more controversial side to this. Um, the, the real low carb jihadis and I am, you couldn't find a more uh, excited and favorable person towards low carb diets. But like, I, I think that the, the movement has really lost its way and been very unscientific in some, some situations. But uh, in the beginning of a low carb diet, people may be able to get away with eating more calories than what they did previously because their body isn't efficient with absorbing fat and, you know, uh, uh, dealing with the, the metabolic machinery of, uh, uh, you know, the low carb process. I think over time though, that people on a long-term ketogenic diet should eat fewer calories, not more. I think it becomes so thermodynamically efficient because of low oxidative stress and whatnot, which I think is good that people on a low carb diet long-term end up needing about 10 to 20% fewer calories than a normal diet. So you can't actually eat like an asshole on a low carb diet indefinitely because you may be 10 or 20% more efficient and it's going to get you in trouble. If you, if you want something that you can just eat, you know, willy nilly, low carb isn't actually it, at least not long term, because I'm, I'm pretty certain that the, the body becomes more thermodynamically uh, efficient over time. And so you're actually going to have to eat less. And for myself and for people I've coached, I have good friends who coach like thousands of people, we see this again and again and again, where the person's been on low carb for a year and to maintain their same level of leanness, we actually need to dial the total calorie intake down a, a non-trivial amount. And so, yeah, I, I, I know that was a long rambling answer, but you know, I, I think that the, uh, what, what do they even call it? The, the, uh, CECO, like the carbohydrate insulin, you know, uh, model. Um, I don't think that's accurate, but clearly macronutrients do matter and they, they matter in large part because of, uh, satiety again. Like if we eat in a way that we don't overeat, then it doesn't really matter, <laughs> you know, at, at the, at the end of the day. And I think it's, it's crystal clear that we can have insulin levels quite low, remarkably low, like undetectably low and still eat in a way that we gain gain body fat. So I think that that, that at, a, at a baseline kind of calls into question a lot of the basic premises that, that like Gary Tobbs and some of the other folks in that, that really ardent um, 
uh, uh, insulin is the only route to weight gain crowd. But I, I do think things like fructose are really um, problematic me metabolically, particularly in liquid form. So it, it's funny, like both sides of this camp have gotten enough things wrong that they're both kind of idiots. And it would be great if we could just wipe the slate clean and just start over with a, you know, a fresh perspective. And I think that this is where we see occasionally folks like Ted Naiman and some other people who come into this topic um, with a really good analytics background, you, you know, data analysis background, they're engineers by training, but they come in with no formal training in medicine or nutrition. They just start looking at, you know, how does shit work and you know what 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 is the science suggest here and they're able to really sift through this and you don't see many of them ending up stuck on one side or the other of this like oh it's only carbs or it's only fat or you know um uh only calories matter well okay but you know if i eat in a way that makes it impossible for me to not overeat overeat in a free living situation that that's really important. Not, not everybody can live in a metabolic ward, you know? So it, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head with this one. And that is that, um, there is a lot of, there's a lot of intelligence. There's a lot of validity on both sides of the camp, but, um, people on both sides have dug their heels in. And because of that, we almost have like a, uh, nutritional partisanship mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we're dealing with right now that if we did clean the slate and we looked at all of the valid research on both sides, we would understand that, you know what, it's actually a bit of both. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, get, coming back to the carbs, it's not just uh low carb or, um, or low fat. It's, it's also about the type of carb, which, you know, is, is, uh, a lot of what's behind that Weitzman study that, you know, not all carbs affect us the same way because we're all very complex individuals and in our genetics, our microbiome, all of those things can affect the way that we metabolize those carbs. And one of the things I loved about the book, uh, as we get towards the second half is that seven day carb test. Now you, before that you have a, a 30 day reset and uh, everyone's going to have to buy the book if they, uh, they want to learn about that and they should, uh, we don't have enough time to cover it, but I was so excited to read the seven day carb test because I started in the, um, the other end of the spectrum with this test. I actually, uh, in fact, we're just wrapping up our own little internal, um, it's, uh, it's kind of an anecdotal study, but we looked at apples I spiked when I started at Cygnos uh, in 2020, put my first CGM on. I had an apple and I spiked to like 160 to 180, somewhere in there. And I stopped eating apples. And uh, reading an article about apples, I had realized there's 20,000 different varieties and maybe I should test apples. Mm. So I've now recorded my response to 38 different apple varieties and they go from absolutely no uh, glycemic response, zero, up to a uh, plus 45 for the Cosmic Crisp. Oh, interesting. A, huh. Yeah, which is a recently bred apple that's bred to be very, very sweet. Right. Uh, so obviously it, uh, it spiked me. But then I rolled this out to our staff at Cygnos and had everyone trying different apples and recording their response. And just like the Weissman study, everyone had a different response to different varieties of apples. So right. I, I started at a very micro level. You start at the macro level. But maybe talk a little bit about the idea behind the carb test the, and why it's an important part of, of, of a person's uh, fitness journey. Yeah, you know, it was an extension of the observation from the Weitzman studies that uh, when folks optimize their blood glucose response, regardless, of, you know, it's like, okay, so – White rice isn't great for you at the cup level, but at the quarter cup level, your blood sugar is attenuated and then your gut looks good, your inflammatory markers look good, and you're not hungry later. And so, so long as they, they folks figured out a way of keeping their blood sugar at pretty modest levels, um, that, that seemed to be the way to go. And I, this is, inferential stuff, but I, I think it's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of good at that I, I was like, well, what's the blood glucose response of non-Western populations? Like, how do they respond to like an oral glucose tolerance test, for example? And there's not a ton of data on this, but there is data out there. And what was fascinating is the in these um, non-Westernized populations, both hunter-gatherer and horticulturalists, 
And, and it, it, it's worth keeping in mind that these folks are small. Like the men are about 135 pounds, the women, you know, proportionately smaller. So they're not big people and they're still giving them 75 or 100 grams of, of glucose in these tests. But these people are so metabolically healthy that it was rare that the, the blood glucose response of these folks got above 100 uh, nanograms per deciliter, which was just jaw dropping. Like they're very, very good at handling glucose. And so I somewhat arbitrarily added a, uh, you know, a 10, 15 percent upward limit on that. And so I, I suggested that if people kept their blood glucose below 115 uh, nanograms per deciliter that that they'd probably be okay. I think that's actually a little on the high side from what we would ideally want, but it, you know, it was this kind of general population book. And, and uh, I honestly, we had, we had rolled this process out in a clinical setting. I'm on the, the board of directors of a, a medical risk assessment uh, clinic in Reno, Nevada. And so we got to do some of this with some folks and people really liked it, but I just wasn't sure how it would be embraced at the, the macro level. And in the book, I only recommend, I recommend that people pick carbohydrates, that you eat it in the morning without anything else, no protein, no exercise. We're really trying to test the carbohydrate in as precise a way as we can and exercise and other things kind of, kind of influence all that. And, um, and ideally, and in the book, I only recommend that you check at the two hour mark for your blood glucose and that it's not above 115 nanograms per deciliter. Ideally, the person would check their blood glucose before at one hour and at two hours. And that's where a CGM can be handy, even though the CGMs aren't quite as pinpoint accurate. They're great with trends, but, you know, you maybe maybe do a little bit of both on that stuff. But the the idea there and when what we the feedback that we've had is that if people eat in a way that they they do well with a carb or an amount of carb then things go well and and what's been interesting too is that folks have done that 7 day carb test and let's say they just had terrible response to everything that they ate like it was really really terrible um they will do a reset they will lose weight they will start strength training um, some of these people have gone carnivore, you know, because they had complex gut issues and everything. And, and then they go back and they reintroduce the carbs and they do the seven day carb test and they do really well six months later. So that's been super cool. Like it doesn't happen that way for everybody. Mine, mine has improved some, not, not a ton with, with doing certain things. Ironically, um, my carb tolerance is better eating few vegetables because my gut isn't as irritated from fewer vegetables. So I eat like fruit, maybe a little bit of rice, maybe a little bit of uh, sweet potato or white potato. And I do pretty, I do markedly better with that than I did earlier when every single meal had a big whack of like cabbage or kale or, you know, whatever. And that stuff was chronically apparently irritating my gut because I, my IBS stuff is far better now with fewer vegetables than what it was previously. But it was the combination of looking at both the kind of objective feedback of blood glucose and then the subjective elements of like, how is my digestion? Do I get any brain fog or lethargy or fatigue? And using those things to kind of triangulate in on on how exactly do I want to partition out the the food? Yeah. And just so uh, our listeners know, when you go into this test, Rob's done the work, uh, has given us the um, the essential carbohydrates in a bunch of different portion sizes. Yep. So you can go and you can pick these different foods. Uh, and like he said, we're, we're trying to eliminate variables that might confound results. So doing this first thing in the morning, don't have anything other than maybe black coffee or tea without any sweeteners or cream or anything. Um, and then see what your response is for Rob's study two hours out. Uh, of course, on Cygnus, we've got that granularity of um, readings every every fifteen um, every five minutes. I'm sorry, using the Dexcom G6, where every five minutes we're getting uh, readouts, so we can really uh, drill down on this stuff and understand. Uh, what type of carbs work for us and what don't, similar to what the participants in the Weitzman study uh, yeah. were able to find in their own analysis. I, you've inspired me, Rob, to go back and not be so granular about this stuff. So, okay, I did 38 apples, but now go back and actually test out just basic groups of carbohydrates to see, okay, which ones 
am I responding best to in terms of glycemic response? Yeah. And then using that, a um, couple things I want to drill down on. I, I was I was amused by the fact that your first test in the book was white rice. And you said, I cooked the white rice the night before, put it in the fridge, and then had it the next morning. This is actually the first test I did with a CGM, is I read an article about resistant starch. Yep. And it said, uh, cook some rice, put it in the fridge overnight, and then eat it the next morning because that rice has built some resistant starch. And then try fresh cooked rice. And I understand why you did what you did, because if you're eating this first thing in the morning, who wants to get up? and cook uh, rice, it's going to take, you know, an hour if you do it in a rice cooker, two hours if it's brown rice. Uh, but yeah, there might actually be a difference between that cooled rice from overnight and the rice that you have fresh. If you've got a rice cooker with a timer, maybe you can try that out. But here I am getting granular again. Uh, we got to yeah, go and, back and just... And, and for me, there was no difference, like the resistant no starch difference. versus no uh, non-resistant starch. And I got it. You know what? For that time, there was no difference, I want to say, because just anecdotally, I've been dropping in a quarter or maybe a half cup of rice post jujitsu on on harder days and, and whatnot. And I don't end up with the blood sugar crashes now, but I'm not eating the vegetables that I ate then. So yeah. that gut yeah. irritation thing may be... A factor and it's still all um, chilled rice. And, you know, one thought on the apple stuff, too, there's a little bit of a hip fake that can happen there because uh, fructose is about one and a half times sweeter than than sucrose or glucose. And some of these these uh, uh, kind of modern bread varieties, um, they can be remarkably sweet, more fructose, and it's not going to affect your glucose response on the Right, because it's going to stay in the liver. Yeah. The liver is going to be the one that, that's going to metabolize yeah. that. So, so yeah, the, it doesn't actually enter the bloodstream. But another thing I wanted to mention, and the reason I loved the seven-day carb test, and I had already mentioned this earlier, when you ask people to experiment with food, to take some simple readings, I think the side benefit that might actually be greater than some of the learnings is the mindfulness you've mm -hmm, introduced. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, I'll use my apple example. Okay, yeah, it was extreme. But before doing it, I would just go into the grocery store and just kind of mindfully put fruit in my uh, my cart. And now I'm thinking a lot about it. And when I actually eat it, I'm savoring the fruit and trying to like understand, do I really like this one? Uh, is it worth the, um, the impact right. uh, for this cosmic crisp versus not? And yes, yeah, there is that. Uh, apples have different combinations of fructose, sucrose, and, and, and glucose. So, yeah, there is that kind of uh, hip fake in there. But um, I think what, what you've done through this test is help people get more mindful about what they're eating. And I think that goes a long way. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to diminish also for a lot of people, um, they're not geeks like we are. And so doing something like this, it's like, oh, I'm doing some science. Like it feels very sciencey. Like you, you, mm -hmm. you've got a, I've got a, I'm going to test my blood sugar. And usually you only do that at the doctors mm -hmm. and I'm doing it in this format. So it feels very, uh, sciencey and it, it, and it is in a, in a lot of ways. And that really ends up having a lot of impact on people. People are like, oh, I'm going to take this seriously. You know, this is serious stuff. And so I, I don't want to, underplay the significance of doing things like this because um at the end of the day like you know you and i will not run out of a job trying to help people fix their metabolic woes you know it, the right. congressional budget office has predicted that, that by 2035 the u.s is bankrupt from diabetes related costs and we can do every single thing we can think of, and we're probably not going to avert that that catastrophe, you know. So really, at the end of the day, it's whatever moves the most people in the most favorable direction. There is a reality that some of this quantified self stuff is the thing that, like, people get the deeper insight. They look behind the curtain. They're like, holy smokes, like, Oreos do that to my blood sugar? I, I had not a dream of that. And so then we, we start getting some, some behavior change off of that very granular bit of information. So I, I, I can be overly critical on that too. I think it's a, I think it's a balance. You know, we want, again, it's a tool, you know, like that granularity yeah. is very powerful and also pulling back and just getting people, if we can get people to where they're in their body and they're like, oh, I ate that. And like, I can feel my blood sugar is high. And they'll get to the point where they're like, they'll be within five 
five clicks high or low of what their their glucose is, you know, they'll go test and like, oh yeah, I said one twenty and it was one fifteen, or you know, I said one forty five and it was one fifty, and and uh, uh, people will get to the point where they're like, oh, I notice my vision blurs, I get auditory changes, I get numbness in my hands, like they start feeling what's going on, which I I think is incredible. It really is. We we only have a few minutes left. I want to touch on Element. Now, I um I went to University of Florida undergrad. Okay. So I actually was at the same college as Dr. Cade, who was the inventor of Gatorade. Mm-hmm. Gator and Cade combined into Gatorade. Uh, I know how much sugar is in that stuff, so I stopped Gatorade a long time ago, even though um, a portion of every bottle goes to the University of Florida. Right. Uh, then I got this care package from you guys, um, from Element. You're a co-founder yep. of Element. Wondered if you'd just tell us a little bit about uh, electrolyte, electrolyte drinks, why they're important, and uh, what your thinking is behind Element. Yeah, and you know, just to, to kind of close the circle on the Gatorade topic, way back in the day, Gatorade used to be one gram of sodium per serving, and it used to be less wow. than 100 grams of uh, – or. Uh, 100 calories, 25 grams of carbohydrate. And that's completely flip-flopped. You know, like the carbohydrate has gone up and it's mainly like it shouldn't be fructose. It's a bunch of junk fructose. Like that's not helping athletes at all. Um, So in the beginning, Gatorade was pretty legit. It it was very ahead of its time. But this um, fear of sodium and uh, the ubiquity of cheap carbs has, you know, skewed so much of this stuff, but, uh, you, you know, what to say about electrolytes. If, um, if we look at the most tightly regulated physiological processes in the body, pH and electrolytes are probably it. And if our pH goes a little up or a little down, we will get sick or die. And if our electrolytes are off by, by very much for very long, we, we will get sick and, and potentially die. And we have buffering mechanisms on both sides of that story, but the, uh, the electrolyte piece is, is just interesting, in particular the sodium piece. Most people get the bulk of their sodium from eating processed foods. So arguably people consume too much sodium, but it's not even so much that they're consuming too much sodium. They're consuming too much processed foods because there are traditional cultures like the, the Japanese that as part of their traditional diet – they'll eat 10, 12, 15 grams of sodium per day, and they don't have the problems that we've had traditionally, you know, with regards to like hypertension and cardiovascular disease and whatnot. And we're being told to eat less than two grams of sodium per day. So it's not specifically the sodium that's a problem. It's all these other, you know, hyper palatable, highly processed foods. But the the beginning problems that occur when we're in a low electrolyte, low sodium state uh, lethargy, brain fog, fatigue are kind of the beginning things. And when people get to the point of having cramps or, or things like that, like there's really significant problems going on. And most people are aware that if they shift their diet towards a lower carb diet, that they will tend to pee and the, you know, their blood pressure will come down. And, you know, there's this period of time where they're losing a lot of water weight that is called the naturesis of fasting. This is a, a process where when uh, carbohydrate levels are, are low, that we tend to retain less sodium when we shed more sodium and more potassium. And so we've got to, to take on more of that as part of the diet. So anytime people make a move towards a less refined diet, they tend to remove most of the sources of sodium. And, and generally, that means that they need to find a, a different place to replace it. And with Element, we recommend that people eat olives and pickles and sardines and salami and these whole food-based, you know, items that are also rich in sodium, rich in potassium and magnesium. But that's not always convenient. And sometimes you just can't get enough doing, doing it that way. And that was really the genesis of the whole Element product. And it, it, it's just grown like wildfire because there's clearly this really significant need for an adequately powered electrolyte with sodium that also doesn't have sugar in it. And so we've, we've kind of threaded this needle of, of meeting a lot of different needs and the stuff tastes pretty good. And generally if we get people to just try it, they end up buying it. So our, our main marketing deal has been give product away. And and when people try it, they love it and they end up signing up and doing it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, Rob, uh, how can people find you? 
Uh, robwolf.com is kind of the main hub for where everything happens. They can find the podcast, uh, uh, our online community, the Healthy Rebellion has links there. So that's where most of the action happens. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to go through the seven day test myself. And uh, maybe we'll have you back at some point to discuss some of the results and some of your other um, books that you've you've written. I would love to talk about those as well. But thank you so much for a really enlightening discussion. Huge honor to be here. Thank you. And I'd love to I will bring down property values anytime you want me to. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Body Signals. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and review us. Your feedback is very important. We have a special offer for Body Signal listeners, a 20% discount on Cygnos. Just go to Cygnos.com, pick out your plan, and get a CGM in the mail to connect your body in a whole new way. During checkout, you can use the code BODYSIGNALS, that's all one word, no spaces, body signals, to get your 20% discount. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next episode.